Just Imagine, a podcast series by Imagine Theatre. Yes, hello again. I'm Martin Ballard and welcome to episode 77 of this podcast series and the latest in our occasional series looking at popular pantomime titles. This time, it's Snow White. For more information, go to their website at www.imaginetheatre.co.uk. Now, in the last episode, I was joined by joint CEOs of Imagine Theatre, Managing Director Steve Bowden and his wife, Business and Marketing Director Sarah Bowden, to find out what's going on behind the scenes at Imagine Imagine HQ and to get exciting news about the new Panto season. If you missed that or any of the other previous episodes, you can, of course, still listen to them. And there are many more to come from one of the UK's biggest producers of pantomime and children's theatre. So make sure you subscribe where you normally get your podcasts. And don't forget, if you have any questions about Imagine Theatre or pantomime in general, send them in using the Get In Touch section of the website at imaginetheatre.co.uk and we'll answer another of those questions later on in this episode. So this time, it's the latest in our occasional series looking at the most popular pantomime titles and we're turning our attention to Snow White. I've been joined by Imagine's Artistic Director, Eric Potts. Good morning, Martin. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And the actor known for his roles in movies like Book of Blood, Neds and Glasgow Girls, as well as popular television shows like River City and Outlander, as well as recent pantos in Kilmarnock, James McInerney. How are you? Ah, great. Thanks for having me, Martin. And good morning, Eric. Uh, great to be here. I'm looking forward to our chat about Snow White. James, let's talk about you first of all, because obviously you've got a, a fantastic list of credits in terms of film and television. But where did you start getting involved in Panto? Uh, it was actually at school, uh, like probably most people was at their first introduction to sort of drama and, and uh, plays and Panto was at school. We didn't have a, our school in Glasgow didn't have a drama department. So there was a wee sort of club after school for people that were interested in acting. And the first sort of play we put on was a, a, a sort of wee made up pantomime for Christmas and any money raised sort of went to the sort of local charity. So that was the sort of first time I got involved in Panto. It was a fourth year at school. I'm not sure how that translates down to England, but I was about 16, 15 or 16. So that was my first sort of intro to Panto. And what do you love about it? I just think, uh, Eric, obviously he's a, the master of all, but I think compared to doing like other productions, plays or TV or film, I think it's just that every single show is different. And I think people say, ah, but if you do live theatre, every, every night's different. That, to some extent, that's true, but with Panto especially, the actual performance, because if you're doing a play, you're sort of stuck within the parameters of the play, whereas with Panto, you can have immediate reaction from the audience and actually take it in a different direction. So I think that's the most enjoyable thing for me, is that who knows where it's going to go. Obviously, there's a start, middle and end, but between that, there's a bit of room for uh, having a laugh and uh, taking it somewhere else. Now, the interesting thing, historically, of course, at the height of Music Hall and Variety, Pantomime would go on well up to Easter and beyond and the variety stars would then go straight into summer season. A lot of people don't think that there is a, much of an appetite for Panto, you know, just after Christmas. And that's why, you know, most of the runs end in January. But you've just done an Easter Panto, haven't you? How did that go? Yeah, it was, it was strange. It's the first time I've ever done an Easter Panto. But when you actually look at pantomimes at Christmas, there isn't that really many references to actual Christmas. You know what I mean? If you take Snow White, you take all the big ones, Jack and the Beanstalk, Aladdin. It, it, there's nothing specific to Christmas, so it can easily go on throughout the year. And I think a lot of the sort of, when I was young, I think that my mum and dad went to the famous Butlins for the resort. And I think I, I do remember seeing one back back then in the summertime. As I say, that was my first one and it was sold out and the kids absolutely love it. But when you, you just take a step back, there's no direct references to Christmas, so there's, there's no need why it can't go on the whole year. And do the audiences turn up in large numbers as they would at Christmas, the Easter time? Yeah, yeah. As I said, it was, I think, I think it was like 90, they done 95% ticket sales. It, it was meant to be in Motherwell Civic, which is unfortunately had to close for building renovations or something. So they put it on an Airdrie Town Hall. So everyone was a wee bit skeptical about moving venue, but yeah, 93% ticket sales. So it was completely. For us, it looked packed every show, maybe the odd seat here and there, but, and the kids were going crazy for it. Well, Eric, you did mention before we started this that, that you and James go back a long way. You've worked together a, a number of times, of course, and um, and, and he didn't really recognise your voice today, did he? No, see, this is the problem, because uh, underneath this RP voice, I'm a Scot, and when I'm working with, with Jamesy, uh, it's a overseeing the Kamana Campanto, uh, which James has been in for several years. That's mainly because we get a grant to use him. 
um, <laughs> rather than <laughs> ability. Can I clarify that? And Jamesy hears me as as my native Ayrshire because I was born literally, I think, about uh, what seven about seven eight miles away from Kilmarnock, where the um, the panto is that we both work on. But James is it's such a, a great and valued member of the Imagine team. He's certainly right when he says that no two pantos are the same, which is very much the case when he's in them, because no one quite knows what he's <laughs> going to say next. But he uh, is a, a great um, member and a great storyteller. And I think that is part of, of the conversation you were having about can panto happen um, outside the, the, the festive Christmas period? And yes, it can, because basically we are telling a, a family-friendly story that just happens to have become part of that holiday season. But the Easter panto, the summer panto and the autumn panto are becoming more and more popular. And as James has said, there's very little actual specific Christmas reference in them. So as long as that storytelling is done with truth and comedy and all the other things we expect from what we have become to know as traditional panto, then, yeah, it proves really popular um, for many companies and many venues throughout the year, including Butlins as well, of course. So when you write a script, Eric, for Kilmarnock, does it say James enters stage left and says whatever he likes <laughs> yeah, pretty much i mean I've, I've learned over the years not to write too much because i i sort of the, the joy is sitting in rehearsals you go oh god a line i recognize but whatever he says is delivered <laughs> it's delivered with real commitment and panache yeah i've got to say that because we're hoping he'll come back and work for us again this year <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's end this character assassination and um, <laughs> let's talk about Snow White then. And, and we always start by talking about the story predominantly, Eric, and the uh, mm. and the roots of it. And I mean, it, it goes back a long way as a fairy tale. And like the weather we've had this year, it's it's grim, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And we've, we've started quite a few of these podcast chats with, with the words Grimm, uh, because so many of these tales uh, originate from the Brothers Grimm. Uh, this first outing for this one was towards the, the, the beginning of the 1800s, 1812, I think it first appeared in the Grimm's fairy tale compendium as, as tale 53. And it, it grew and it developed as a lot of them do. I think the final version was published in mid 1800s, 1857, and was pretty much the version that we know today with the magic mirror the poisoned apple and of course the feature of and it can be either seven woodcutters or it can be seven dwarves and um, seven dwarves is the version of course that we predominantly know and was the version that disney carried forward as well so uh, as with many of these tales that we've discussed in the past there are all sorts of regional variations but the one that we've come to to know best with all the identifiable features within it comes from the original Grimm tale, which uh, in German is known as Schneewitchen. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> Just not being Scottish, but a bit of German thrown in as well. Uh, I don't care. The theme, as you said, you know, it's been adapted um, in fairy tales all over the world. There are lots of variations. The theme allegedly goes right the way back to Roman times and a legendary story uh, of a character called Snow. But why do you think it's so popular, James? What What's so special about Snow White? Like Eric just said, it's, it's over 200 years old, so there's certainly something that everybody can relate to and, and, and it, lasts, it, lasts that, it endures that amount of time. So I think basically it's got, it's got the sort of stereotypical things you want. It's got the, the beautiful sort of young uh, girl in it. It's got the the evil villain being the stepmother and it's got it's got the sort of unusual thing whether it be seven woodsmen or seven dwarves it's it's just got all those sort of characteristics that make it interesting and sort of goes down the old format of good versus bad i think everybody can relate to that and, and it will have a it will endure for another 200 years now i'm told that it was quite a late comer to the panto canon and um that was predominantly down to Disney, something we talked about with Eric a, a lot of times. You know, once the Disney full-length feature came out in 1937, it didn't take long for Panto producers to actually cotton on to this and think this would work really well. I'm told as well that the early Pantos were actually licensed through Disney, which is bizarre. Jim, this is something we've we've spoken about a number of times, but how important do you think it is for an audience, particularly children, that they relate to the story. And is that where Disney comes in? I think so. Well, I think like if you look at the original version of the Grimm Brothers version, like when eventually it came down to people naming it the dwarves, it was like, I can't remember the earlier, but it was like Glick, Blick, Flick, Slick. There wasn't really anything that, that the young ones could relate to. So obviously that's when Disney comes in and makes like the names like 
like dopey and, and grumpy and all those ones that are a lot more relatable for the kids. And obviously that's where Disney's the best at what they do. Do you know what I mean? They make they make it accessible. They open, they open it up to a much bigger audience. Because like, I think if if you obviously you'd spoke about the top of the show, Martin, as well. If you, if, if Disney had literally put the the grim version on. If they animated that original version, I mean, it'd be a horror, it'd be an 18 plus, you know, when the rate would be 18, <laughs> and no kids would be able to go and see it. And the name's like Blick Glick. It doesn't really make it interesting or accessible for the kids, I don't think. So that's where Disney sort of that, that come to the forefront and do what they always do best. Yeah, those original fairy tales are incredibly dark. And this one, um, Eric, has a number of unique features as well. And we've mentioned some of them already. The Magic Mirror, uh, the Seven Dwarves, the Wicked Queen, uh, so female baddie. I guess even the Glass Coffin and things like that are sort of things that people expect. Very much so. And they, they tend to miss them if they're not there. And I think, um, as James has said, it, it is right. It's because they know the Disney version. And we've had this conversation before, Martin. It's the Disney effect that people know the story and they are the pantos that box office wise certainly do best there's an irony to it of course because disney now decree that you can't use the dwarf names that were in the film so doc in our version has to become prof and things like that so that there are copyright legislation in place that we cannot use the disney names but it's very much using all the iconic imagery, which Disney themselves lifted from the original tales, the grim tales, that are then carried forward. It's those parts of the story, which, as we know, kids love to be one step ahead of the story. They know what's going to happen. It's when you turn a page in a, a children's storybook, they know the words on the page already. And it's the same with Panto. If there's anything that isn't familiar to them, they then struggle and sit back in the seat um, rather than leaning forward and, and following that narrative with excitement as we want them to. Now, we always talk about the, the particular demands of, of any panto and, and some of those unique demands, whether it be a, a walking, talking giant or a flying carpet. And I, I guess one of the things that is the most challenging for producers in the 21st century, at least, is casting the seven dwarves. There are various debates about whether they should be dwarves, dwarf actors, whether they should be puppets and so on. And it's an interesting one, not least because of the budget of the production and so on so it, it's a it's a bit of a conundrum in some ways isn't it it is really and uh starting kind of from the 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 point that most producers will start, as you mentioned, Martin, it is budget. Because unlike any other panto, you've immediately got a cast of seven before you go on to the other principal characters, your Snow White, your comic, your Dane, potentially, your Wicked Queen. So it's quite an expensive panto to do if you're casting several people in the roles. And the, there is lots of debate about whether or not it is right to do so. But if you were to ask the, the dwarf community, they said, well, no, you know, we want it. That's the story. Why are you changing the story? We are here ready, really wanting and willing to play these roles. And we find that people, because they think it's not acceptable um, in, in today's sort of culture, that we, we're losing out on, on what we do. We're losing out on work. And there are other other ways. The last time, um, it, it, James E, certainly in Kilmarnock, when we presented Snow White, it was a really lovely show. We used the junior ensemble to represent the um, dwarfs. And we have another version, which is how we will be presenting the tale this year in Leicester at the De Montfort Hall, sort of following on from Avenue Q and Warhorse in the puppetry style of things. So the dwarfs um, are operated by seven ensemble we, who are very visible. We're not hiding them in any way. And the sticks that operate the arms um, are visible. Um, as you said, as I said, in Avenue Q style, um, it's become much more accepted for that to be seen and actually it works terribly well in that particular version yeah and it's worth pointing out as well some people say dwarf actors shouldn't just be playing dwarfs because that's typecasting and you know they can mm. offer much more than that and that's the case with imagine pantos isn't it you know dwarf actors have played all sorts of characters yes simply because they are good actors uh, not because they're dwarfs that's that's you know it's the same principle as are they the best person for the job yes they are because um, they are great performers with great skills that shouldn't just be pigeonholed if you like into the roles of of one of the seven within the the tale of snow white that was about the baddie in snow white 
James, because the Wicked Queen is an interesting one in comparison to others like Abenaza and so on. And, and uh, you know, like like other baddies or some other baddies, at least she has a henchman, doesn't she? Yep. And I think you sort of touched on it earlier, Martin, as well. I think when Snow White came to the scene, it was quite unusual to have a sort of female baddie, to see a woman in that sort of, in that guise, you know what I mean? So I, th I think it sort of opened up, new do like sort of opened up an opportunity for, for women. Basically, I had a henchman, which is like, it's just a good way of getting sort of it's a sort of go between so the the, the, the the wicked queen of the state where it can be in the in the the castle or whatever ever fairy tale land she's in and the huntsman can or, or the henchman can go back into the forest and actually go looking for her so it's a good way to sort of link snow white back to the mm. the wicked queen but just to sort of cement what, what Eric said as well, Martin. I was reading something recently about Peter Dinklage, who's obviously one of the most sort of famous actors in the business. And he 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 was saying that it's about time Disney moved with the times and actually done away with the dwarves and all that stuff. Which is fine. That's that's his thing, and he's got a point to some extent. But then then there's a counter argument. There was loads of sort of dwarf actors coming on and saying, "Well, hold on a minute. This is part of your work. If you take this away from us, you're actually doing us out a job." So it was quite an, an interesting to see two different takes from the same community coming out with it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, debates like this will go on, and I think it's important that they do, because it's only through discussion that we'll reach any sort of balance that everybody can be happy with. I think the uproar with the Disney movie started with the fact that the dwarves weren't going to be dwarves at all, and we're going to be seven friends or seven helpers. I think Disney's actually backtracked on that a little bit now, and those characters are partly going to be created through CGI. But we're talking about diversity of casting in all sorts of areas and pantomime has a responsibility here but i think in many ways it's led the way eric i don't know if you would agree you know we've been talking about you know male and female dames male and female principal boys all of the roles in a panto can be played by a performer of any age size gender or ethnicity very much so and i think that's i think that's been the case for a significant amount of time obviously with the you know the the blokes playing the dames and the principal boys and everything but i think moving forward into the the cultural situation that we find ourselves in these days it really is great that the diversity within panto can be achieved and should be achieved as much as it is and it's something certainly that imagine strive for year on year and it, again it's about who is the best person for the job but at the same time, it doesn't matter in theory what they look like, as you say, their ethnicity. They can play those roles, and they can. And as long as we are telling the story truthfully and well, and engage our audiences from you know three to one hundred and three, then it really doesn't matter. And as long as they're telling it well then the job is done. And similarly, that goes, I believe, with the, the dwarfs as well. I wrote some narrative uh, inserts for a Snow White on Ice version, which toured the UK with some fabulous Russian ice skaters. And they were the, the seven huntsmen in that particular version. And it, it worked just as well because they were telling the recognisable story, but just obviously, I, I dare say, simply because of the, the skaters that were available, uh, they were seven <laughs> huntsmen in, in that version. So it's all about being true to the narrative and the, the, the icons within the narrative. But I think from the point of view of casting, that can be really flexible and, in, and, and indeed should be these days. What else is there about Snow White do you think that makes it so different to other pantos? Some of the stuff I've already touched on, I, th I think to see that like, most pantos you go to see is maybe get a caster. It's sort of gets seven principles. But as soon as Snow White opens, you know you're going to get at least... 10, 11 characters on stage. You obviously, with, if, if you do it with the seven dwarfs, that's your sort of seven right away. Then you've got your king or, or the, the wicked stepmother, Snow White, uh, the huntsman. So I think that that sort of stands out a bit because usually when we do Snow White, it's, uh, it's always a bit of a bigger cast if you're going to have the seven dwarfs in it. In terms of the set, this, like all Panto adventures, takes you to lots of different places, doesn't it? Off into the woods, the uh, dwarf's cottage, the palace. So you can really go to town, can't you? That's I think that's one for the for the for the kids coming to see it as well. For the young ones coming to see it, I think that's that's the thing. When you when it goes from the splendor of the palace to 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 the sort of scary woods before you get to the cottage, and obviously the cottage is always no matter what production you go and see that 
if it's a half decent one, the cottage is always so magical from the outside. And then there's always some kind of, you see the wee cottage with maybe a wee bit of smoke coming out the chimney and then they have the reveal when you get inside. It's just, I think that's one of the beautiful things that, that the kids love to see is all the different sort of sets and bit Snow White, as you said, it's got all that. And Eric, this one doesn't really have a flying coach or a giant or a flying carpet or a cave of wonders. Does it really have that sort of spectacular transformation scene or, or you know, wow factor that the others do? It's bizarre, but always I find the entrance of the dwarfs is a real impact moment, and mm-hmm. um, whether it be at the top of the show or as I tend to tended to write it over the years they appear slightly later so the narrative is very much established and then you you suddenly hear the dwarfs singing as they enter and that, that always gets a great response but you can make real impact moments the transformation of the wicked queen into the hag mm-hmm. before she goes to poison snow white in the in the woods so the, the, over the cauldron that can be a real impact moment if it's done properly and her destruction at the end you can have great moments with the magic mirror be it um, done live or whether it be pre-recorded with someone uh, in the mirror timed dialogue to be um, played live with the performer playing the wicked queen on stage so there are as you say it doesn't have that flying horse or anything like that cinderella or the cave of wonders from aladdin but there are certainly ways within the story that you can have those real panto impact moments and certainly my experience from from the past few years uh, doing the title with imagine we've we've really managed to make those do quite a bit of heavy lifting within the show and the audience really enjoy them i think one of the biggest impacts like eric said i think in all the panto I've done. I think the, the the biggest audience reaction I think I've ever seen was as because it's so iconic is is when the old hag presents the apple. Mm. To see that because I think it's it's one of the ones that every single person watching that knows that's the thing that could possibly end sort of the, the main the, the the hero of the of the panto. Mm. Whereas in, in other pantos you you don't know oh, how, how's the henchman going to do away with or how they're going to kidnap the the, the princess whatever. But as, as soon as that apple appears. It's like the impact, the, the kids just go, abs- I mean, the, the actors on stage can literally just say what they want because nobody's ever going to hear them because <laughs> until, that, until that apple disappears, there won't be one bit of quiet. The other thing I was going to say is the the moment when, you know, Snow White is revived and comes back to life is, is a bit of a wow factor in itself, Eric. But it brings mm. us to something else that's been much debated in recent years, and that, that is the so-called true love's kiss. Now, that's something producers and scriptwriters have to be aware of, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I think rightly so these days. Um, so uh, from the point of view of scripting, we make sure that the relationship between Snow White and the Prince is as established um, as it can be in, in the first half of the show. And we we know that when um, the Prince goes to kiss Snow White to bring her back to life, that it, it is a consensual is she, you know the dialogue has pre-established that they are very much in love and that this is something that Snow White would be happy to to be happening. It is just about making sure that we and I'm going to use the phrase tick all those boxes but it's more than that it's that we we don't offend that we're truthful to the story but we're very much bearing in mind the modern society that we live in. Yeah and in terms of the popularity of this title I think Snow White is is up there and always has been you know maybe predominantly because of the fabulous Disney movie but it's one that audiences still want to see isn't it? Yeah I think it's, it's probably been what the most popular one I've ever been in and, and like you said when uh, yourself and Eric asked me to come on this I sort of did a wee bit of research and like Snow White is the biggest grossing film uh, if it was nowadays time it'd be the biggest the animated film would be the biggest grossing film of all time I think in the opening it took I think it was like I think the budget was one and a half million which is obviously way back then in the 60s or whenever it was but it grossed two billion pounds in, in today's money so that just shows the, popular, the popularity there. Do you know what I mean? For an animated film to gross two billion pounds in, the, in this day and age, it's un. I mean, you think Star Wars and your Pirates of the Caribbean, I think they were half of that. So mm. that, I think that that just that just proves like how popular Snow White really is, and like and like we spoke about earlier, I think it will go on and go on. Yeah, it has all the elements that we've spoken about many, many times, Eric. So in terms of its future, despite 
the scrutiny that the title has had in recent years, I think it has a really, really bright future still, doesn't it, as a panther? I think so. Certainly from our experience producing it year on year, it always does very well at the box office and it's always very well appreciated by audiences and um, reviewers, the critics, actually on presentation. And and I think because it is such a traditional tale, um, hopefully told well, like the other Panto titles, yes, it's going to remain popular. Panto, we mustn't forget, is still one of the very few genres within our industry that can sustain five, six, eight, nine weeks, two shows a day. Uh, there are very few other shows that are capable to make that box office equation work. And I think it's it's because of the the longevity of tales like Snow White and the popularity that they generate. I think it's going to be around for a long while. And finally, James, from your point of view, a lot of actors talk about this, but with such a a, a wide variety of work in film and television, a lot of people still say they prefer theatre in general and maybe panto in particular as the most rewarding art form because you get immediate reaction from any audience. That's it. It's that direct, that direct reaction and that, that direct involvement with, with, the, with the audience, which Panto, for me, stands alone. doesn't matter how big a comedy play you're doing or whatever, you've not got that direct connection with the audience, and that's why I think, and cross my fingers, that Panto will last for forever. Do you know what I mean? Cause it's just the, it's the best. For an actor to do it, I look forward to it every year, not just because Eric's scripts are amazing. He'll get up, give him, he'll pay me, <laughs> he's going to pay that five in a couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> no, but just, just I just, that's, I think that's, it's one of the points of the year that you actually look forward to to doing because you know you're just going to get that reaction from the audience. And just finally, before we finish, to make it absolutely clear, despite what you've both said about each other, are you happy to work together again? I can't wait. I always uh, love working with Jamesy. And I know uh, he feels the same. <laughs> I absolutely do. But Martin, it's, 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 going to, it's, going to be, it's going to be a trying year this year because Eric's always said uh, I'm, a, I'm a clown. And this year, he's just stuck to his word. He's actually put me in a big top in Kilmarnock. So. Yeah, the, the venue in Kilmarnock is closed for major refurb for the next couple of years. So we'll be presenting Goldilocks in a circus tent provided by Chipperfields on the playing fields on the outskirts of Kilmarnock. Obviously, I'm devastated that I can't be there doing it with Jamesy, <laughs> but I'm sure he'll have a lovely time and discover all sorts of insects that he's never come across before. <laughs> well, I think for that particular panto, it's a perfect way of staging it, isn't it? And um, I'm yeah. sure it'll be as popular as ever. I wish you all the very best of luck, not least working together again. <laughs> no, can't wait. Can't wait, Martin. Ditto. Um, Eric <laughs> and James, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank, thank you, you, Martin. Now, before we finish, a question for associate producer and head of celebrity casting at Imagine Theatre, Laura Taylor. And the question is... Apart from talent, what else do you look for when casting a show? Well, talent is obviously always the first starting point. Uh, We need to make sure that our performers are always really, really capable. It's about keeping the quality and the standard of the production up. So that's always our starting point. But we also look for other things. We like to find people with a local connection or a connection to the theatre that we're casting them in. That always makes it feel extra special and bespoke to that certain venue and area and demographic. We also also make sure that there is a good gender balance within the cast and we also look for diversity and that's not just um, ethnic diversity although we always try and achieve that but also we have a lot of neurodiverse people working for us um, so you know we work with a whole range of performers and the brilliant thing about pantomime is we're not just working with musical theatre people that's probably one of the differences from pantomime um, and other genres in theatre we use entertainment performers, magicians, TV personalities, radio personalities. Um, So there's a real brilliant mix of people that come into a rehearsal room for pantomime. And that's, again, another thing that makes it so special and unique. Thanks, Laura. And that's it for now, I'm afraid. Don't forget to keep your questions about Imagine Theatre or pantomime in general coming in via the Get In Touch section of the website at imaginetheatre.co.uk. Make sure you subscribe through your favourite podcast app and join me, Martin Ballard, next time for episode 78 when we'll be finding out about the roles of lighting and sound designers. Thank you for listening to the latest edition of Just Imagine, the podcast series from Imagine Theatre. 
and you can find out more by going to www.imagintheatre.co.uk.